This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and you can find me at Conquest3 on Twitter. And I'm here with Peter at Wheelie Dealer on Twitter. This is Twin Peaks Investing Podcast number 76. And I want to start this um, podcast really with thanking you all for your fantastic feedback. We had some fantastic feedback for our guest um vonnie um who was on the show in the last episode um at vonnie underscore lea underscore um some of our listeners were so happy with regards to that particular uh podcast they felt it was better without Weedy and i so that tells you all you need to know really we need to get more guests on <laughs> like vonnie um yeah, sure. it's always interested in and i think gives a bit more insight when we have some um some private investors like pete and i on the show it brings another dimension to it and i think what was beautiful about that particular podcast was the fact that vonnie is relatively new um has tried almost every different aspect of investing and is very very passionate very enthusiastic about it and that just so resonated with so many people from all different um levels of investing so i just want to thank everybody for their feedback um all the feedbacks that have been given to us regarding vonnie will be added to the write-up which will be going alongside this um write-up for that particular podcast so i want to thank you all for that pete how are you doing fella yeah not bad of course the other the other thing we must do is we must thank vonnie so yeah thanks vonnie for uh for joining absolutely us. i've been thanking her all week she's been like where's all this feedback coming from what, what are these people saying i'm saying vonnie they're responding to what you said and how you how you behaved and how you interacted and what you shared because there's so many people that are you know new or newer investors five years six years and less um out there at the moment and she was just absolutely fantastic you know, yeah, know that's the thing it's like it's like wherever you are in the journey um you can certainly relate to it because if you if you've only been doing it for six months you're obviously going to get a lot of value out of it if you've been doing it for 15 years 20 years 25 30 years it still takes you back to those early days when you were trying to find your feet and you still pick up the amazing thing is you pick up new things from listening to new people which which you know in some ways is surprising but it's sort of typical of the whole investing and trading game in that you know you can always learn things and it's like even people who are new to the whole experience discover things that you haven't i mean like the fractional investing that that bonnie talked about i sort of read about that some somewhere years ago but i didn't really understand or know much about it because it's not anything that that particularly you know um been a need for me recently but for newer investors that's brilliant idea and and it's it's interesting stuff yeah i think the importance of that what vonnie was saying was the fact that the fractional investing gave her the opportunities to go in with very limited funds if she chose to so she could go in and buy 50 pounds worth of a share or 100 pounds worth of a share or 500 pounds worth of a share as and when she felt like it but she then had a foothold in a company which could be a behemoth company from Google or Tesla or whatever it is, and feel that she was part of the investing game. And I think the important thing that everyone needs to realize is that everyone's at different stages. So everyone can learn something from everybody else. You know, I'm speaking with lots of different people, fund managers and other people around the industry, and they're learning from some of the private investors, Pete. Mm. Yeah, that's why they're on Twitter, you know, and equally we're learning a lot from them. So it's a beautiful, you know, community that we can build just by sharing each other's knowledge. Oh, totally, totally. Now, you asked me earlier how I was doing. I mean, it's it's funny. So I've had um, quite a good day health-wise today. You know, I'm not feeling too bad. And this is one of the biggest frustrations for me. It's like, I feel like I'm sort of making progress and getting better. And I have some really good days. 
and then I slipped back again. So, you know, I'm on a good day today. Fingers crossed. Hopefully I'm getting towards the, 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 the better, the better times. I'm going for a scan tomorrow. We're recording this on Tuesday, 31st of May, uh, 2022, sort of just after six o'clock, whatever. I'm going for a scan tomorrow, CT scan. If there is anything not right, they'll pick it up. I think that actually things are okay. And it's just a case, it just needs a lot of time to heal. That's what I think it is. Okie dokie. I want, want, while we're talking about healing and, and getting better and all the rest of it, is, is ask you to touch on a little bit, because we didn't get chance and didn't, um, I forgot to mention last week the backup trust that you're you're raising monies for. We didn't, for some reason, get any uh, donations to the last podcast. And I know that our listeners love to make donations and, and like to make donations, and we didn't mention it, so it's our fault. So, do you want to say anything about the backup well, trust and all the rest of it? Yeah, do you know it's funny because um, I mean, if someone wants to find the page to donate, it's obviously on Peter's website, and if you go to my wheelie dealer 2 website so that's www.wheeliedealer2.weebly.com there's a twin peaks investing podcast page click on that right at the top you'll find a link through to the backup trust which is the um charity that we're sort of you know um encouraging this year or sponsoring this year or whatever you want to put it um well so far it says we've got 1459 pounds have been donated so I can't remember if that's up. I think golfing that might actually be up on last. I don't know. I can't remember. It feels like it's up on last time I um, looked. There's a comment here from Little Lynn. Um, Great charity choice. Thanks for Twin Peaks podcast. Love the recent session with Bonnie. So this must be after TPI 75. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Little Lynn. It says um, uh, regarding with Bonnie regarding tuition fee analogy. Continue to make lots of mistakes, so continuing to learn. They, they've given us a nice donation there, so that's fantastic. Um, I think I think that's probably the last one we had, but but anyway. So um, backup trust. It's it's a charity that sort of specialises, if you like, in spinal injury. So people who get spinal injuries, um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of rehabilitation and stuff needed, particularly if you if you end up like myself and a wheelchair user. Um, and there's a lot of sort of mental adjustment and whatever. And they do a load of like sports activities and things like, like, um, you know, sort of outward bound courses in Wales, this kind of thing. You know, I think they, they, they do stuff up in the Lake District and whatever. But I think they were originally set up to be really about disabled skiing. From memory, the guy who first set it up was tetrape tetraplegic. Um, and he actually sort of like used to be a skier. And I think he had his accident through skiing and uh, sort of reminds you of Michael Schumacher in a way. But obviously it's a slightly different injury. But um, he wanted to go skiing again or at least to get out in the mountains and whatever. And they sort of created a, a sort of um, a thing that he could sit in and, and you know, go skiing down the hill with kind of thing so so i think that's how it was originally set up quite a long time ago now i think 2025 no it must be longer than that because i was injured 23 years ago and i think the charity had been running probably a good 15 years by the time i sort of first heard about it so it probably has been going 35 40 years um and they do a lot of stuff with children and obviously you know for kids getting a spinal injury i mean it must be so flipping tough you can't imagine Okay, dokie. All right, Pete, I want to move on, if I may, with mm, regards to absolutely. the markets. We try and encourage everybody to, to, to who enjoyed last, last, um, the last podcast with Vonnie to make a donation. Um, I want to get your feel of where the markets are because we've had um, a, quite a volatile May, which is the FTSE's now shut. It's gone six o'clock. Um, the US markets are open still for their last trading day of the month. And it's been a volatile May. Markets have been all over the place. And we've had what I, I'm of a view, of a particular view regarding where the markets are. But I want to get a feel for where you think the markets are, given mm. what we've seen of May so far. What well, are your I thoughts? Mean, I, I sort of get the sense that, I mean, the, the great word to use is capitulation, yeah? I actually did a TikTok video, which you can find at Wheelie Dealer on TikTok, 
and it you should be able to find it there just you know called capitulation three minutes and i talked about it on there and i think i don't feel that we've had a market capitulation yet which is this time when you know the volumes go high and you look at your portfolio you go oh for sake i can't believe my portfolio is so bad you know everything's falling 10%, 6%, you know, every single stock you own is getting battered and you really cannot believe what you're seeing. We haven't got there yet. We've had some really bad days in 2022 and we had some really bad days in 2021, but I don't feel we've got that sort of market clearance, that capitulation yet. So as such, my hunch, my guess is that we won't see that until the autumn. It'll be October, September, October, that kind of time it usually happens where we get a big sell-off. And I think I think we're just going to have a really sideways summer. I just can't see us doing much at all. We've had a bit of a rally in the last week or so towards the end of May. I think we're just going to see this sort of, you know, mucking about for the next couple of months. What, what, what's your sense then? My sense is that where the rallies that we've seen so far are bear market rallies. Yeah. Um, my, I'm still watching certain certain sort of um, numbers. I, I always talk about the numbers regarding the Dow and the S&P and NASDAQ. Um, but I think we need to just keep an eye on the FTSE. The FTSE, remarkably, is help holding up well. Obviously, it's not got a load of big tech names in, in there. And BP, Shell, AstraZeneca has been helping the markets per se over the past well, year to date, it's been helping the market. So that's mm. holding up reasonably well. Um, but I think we need to be careful of that. For the FTSE, 7,300 seems to be sort of the line in the sand. And if that goes, we're looking at 7,2. And then if that goes, we're looking at 7,000. But right now, the FTSE is showing reasonable strength, you know. Mm. Um, the one that's been the weakest of the, of the um, UK indices is a FTSE all share, FTSE aim all share, sorry, yeah. which has been below um, the, the the magic 1000 figure for on and off. And it's currently sitting at around 975. And um, the low for the aim all share is 939. And right now, over the past 12 months, the aim all share is down 25%. So that's in bear territory. So anybody that's got a, f- a portfolio of aim stocks um, of the lower quality ones, could be getting significantly hurt and those that are holding FTSE AIM small caps that have been hurt their portfolio significantly have significantly been hurt what I've spoken about before regarding the markets is to look at look out for the outliers Pete so the stocks that have actually held up um, despite the markets having the volatility so I wanted to talk about three stocks which I've identified um, so I'm always saying look out for the stocks that have held up okay Look out for the stocks that are actually rising when the markets are falling. Those are usually good stocks to keep an eye on for potential for when the markets actually come out of the bear market. Because if they're strong in the bear market, they're going to be strong even in or stronger in a bull market. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So one of the stocks I wanted to talk about was um, Caffins, Pete. Have you, do you know what Caffins do? C-F-Y-N. I, act- I actually bought a car from them, so I do know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they came out with um, with results, and essentially, they're up at the moment. Full, full year prelims, really, really good numbers, Pete. Um, market cap only sixteen million, doing really, really well. They're up ten percent over the month of May, right? So, I just think that kind of strength. You know, people still going out buying cars. It would appear so. You know what I mean? Um, so, so their results are reasonably good. Um, the third one is an events company. Obviously, we've been in lockdown. We're out of lockdown, right? It's Hive, H-Y-V-E. Yeah. yeah. And the interesting thing about that stock, that's up 14% over the month of May, is that that has seen Goldman Sachs buy 14.6 million shares, Pete. Yeah. Ticker symbol H-V-Y-E. And that's a 257, 60 million uh, market cap company. And they came out with interims on the 24th of May. Again, they were showing quite good good numbers there. And the last one is a company involved in the aquatic side of it. It's called Benchmark, BMK, we've spoken about before. Yeah. And that's up 11%. And that had half-year results. 
on the 18th of May. And again, showing some strength. That's up 11% over the course of the month. So that's three companies I want to give our listeners really to just investigate a little bit, have a look. It's not a tip. It's not they're, not, they're not recommendations, just three outliers that I found across three different segments of the of the markets of different of varying different sizes that I think might be worth have, worth having a look at. You know, in a way, that really highlights one of the real challenges at the moment um, with regard to buying anything that you know on all three of those stocks as always you can see positives but equally it's very easy to see negatives as well and i mean Absolutely. In, the, yeah, yeah. in the case of caffeines um i read the results and yeah i think that from memory they were okay uh, and i'd imagine it's on a fairly low rating and stuff um and it and it's got a family link so it's like the the um, CEO or the chairman or something is is Simon Caffin or I made that name, but you know his surname is Caffin and there's a there's a clear it's it clearly a family run business and it's got um, I think they own a lot of the property so there's a really good backing you know from the assets um, but then we come into the difficulties with the car market you know that China's still battling with zero COVID it appears that they're sort of coming out of that now, but God knows how long they're going to be dilly-dallying and going in and out of their, their zero COVID madness. Um, so, so, you know, and then you've got things like the, I heard that the um, used car prices are starting to soften because, you know, they've gone up so much. They're starting to come off a bit. So maybe demand is, maybe demand's reducing a bit in the used car market. So, you know, there's so many things going on. You've then got HYVE. Now, from memory, Hive used to be the events part or whatever of Informa. And they've got, they did have quite a Russian exposure. So obviously that would, would be more than slightly concerning. But then I'm hearing elsewhere, I think I read the results of Euro, Euro Money, what's it called? Euro Money something invest or whatever, whatever the company's called. And their events business is absolutely booming, you know. So you get the anecdote that events is actually recovering strongly from from COVID. Um, And then, of course, you've got Benchmark. And I find Benchmark a really frustrating company because it seems to promise so much. So Benchmark does um, aquaculture, you know, prawns and and salmons and, and I think they do like um yeah they do treatment for sea life for, for salmon and things like that and um and they do um like I think it's like like artificial insemination stuff for prawns or something you know they, you don't need to go into that sort of detail yeah, mate yeah, you don't need you, to go into that sort of detail you know I'm obsessed with that in Jenna so anyway, I know you are no, I don't. honestly all we need, all the, all people need to know is that it's done four consecutive quarters of of revenue growth yeah yeah and it's do, and it's earnings growth. It's doing all right, and then they can go and do the rest of the work themselves. They don't yeah, need to well, know about those leave... sort of details that you are infatuated with, mate. <laughs> well, let, Come I'll, on, I'll leave them to it. But if you look at the history of, of benchmark, it's a lot of promise and, and never seems to deliver it. So anyway, yeah, it's. I mean, th- what what I've got here, Pete? Six months uh, revenue totaled seventy nine point two million versus fifty nine point. 5 million last time and uh, driving adjusted earnings to 15.9 million versus 17.9 million last time. Um, The company's advanced nutrition business reported a 20% 20 improvement in revenue with growth seen across all product areas. The reason why I'm picking it up and saying, look, investigate this further is because a lot of businesses are struggling in this first half and the second half is going to be even more difficult. So the ones that have done okay in the first half may carry on showing continued strength in the second half some of the companies that gave um may trading updates in 2021 haven't given may trading updates this year and there might be good reason why they've not given a may trading update um so any companies that are out there i could name a couple but i won't just watch out because if they give an update in june and it's not strong believe you me those companies are going to get absolutely spanked I'm just looking on SharePad. Um, benchmark is showing on here a forecast PE 
of 62.5. Now, obviously, that's, that's a right. bit skewed because of all the COVID stuff. So let's not get too over too hung up on the on the for, on the immediate forecast earnings. But two years out, its forecast PE is 26. So it's still quite meaty. But you know, people need to look at it and, and make a decision. I believe the revenue growth you talk about is probably from an acquisition. So anyway, need to look into it. Mm. Okay. All right. So what have you got on your, your list of things you want to talk about, Pete? Do you know what? It's one thing I want to want to bring up, which I've never particularly thought about before, and I actually was quite taken with this. Um, people on Twitter may have come across a chap called Eric. Yeah, he's got there's a Twitter account called Eric, basically. Um, do you know him? Do you know the guy? Just Eric. Yeah, it's just Eric. Yeah, but you know the Twitter account, don't you? Is it at following Eric? Is it something else? At, that's him, I think. At following Eric. Right, okay. Pretty pretty sure it is. Let me just let me just beam him up so so we know. Okay. And what do you want to tell us about following Eric? No, it's not following Eric. It's it's another okay. It's an account called Eric who right it's eric underscore uk investor and um nobody knows who he is and whatever but actually he talks a lot of sense right and uh he he um said a thing he said he said in a bull market he goes more concentrated with his portfolio so let's say let's say in a bull market he cuts his portfolio holdings down to 20. In a bear market, he goes more diversified and he may increase it to 30. So it's this idea of when the times are good and the river is flowing in your favor, focus down hard and maximize the gain. But when things are a lot tougher, diversify more and spread the risk more. Well, any thoughts on it? Because I thought it was a really interesting idea. I, I actually like the sound of that. Hmm. Um, I think what happens, unfortunately, in, um, in bull markets is that we overstay our welcome in them um, because we've gotten used to winning, Pete. So, you know, whether you've got a diversified portfolio or a concentrated portfolio, when the markets are going well, everyone's rejoicing and we're all dancing in the street. And I'm going, woohoo, I'm a great investor. Um, but when the markets roll over, we tend not to step back and go, actually, I need to reevaluate, I need to reflect, I need to maybe change my strategy. So the fact that Eric's able to see that and actually trigger that, that's a really good way. And that's part of the process of the conversation I had with. Um, the idle investor Edmund Shing and the strategies that he has in his in his book, The Idle Investor, hmm. and changing it either seasonally or throughout the year or whatever, regarding what's going on with the markets and the cyclicality of the markets. So I think that helps us. Um, but ordinarily, we've done our research on our concentrated portfolio of a dozen stocks or less, and we're like, that's it, those are my 12, I'm gonna hold them forever. Mm -hmm. And the share price goes up and it's up 100% and it comes down to plus 10%, minus 15%, and we're still there. That's my stock. We maybe need to be a bit more proactive. And that's the conversation I've just had with um, um, Reg Hall of um, BHP. Yeah, no, Reg. BHP. Hi, Reg. Yeah. MHP, sorry, MHP Communications. Yeah. Um, and what he does is top slicing, which is what I spoke about last week regarding yeah. AstraZeneca. And there's a chap on, on Twitter called Mike Ridyard, at Ridyard Mike. And he does that religiously, I like feverishly, <laughs> you know, to the point where I'm sure the people go, what the what is he doing? But what he's doing is capturing 5%, 10% here, 15% here. And if he does that, even on the same stock, up as it's going up and down, trimming and, and then adding again when he thinks it's dropped too much, adding again, trimming again, trimming again, adding again, all the rest of it, he's capturing 30 or 40% where... Between there and there in the year, share price has gone nowhere. It's gone up, it's come down, it's gone up, and it's back again. It's like the person that held it from January through December has made nothing at all mm. other than maybe the dividend. So taking the trim might be the idea. I think the... I think yeah. the um... Sorry, I was, I was going to say the second aspect of it, Pete, mm. 
what you were saying about Eric was that he expands and, and then has diversification, right? And I've always been, oh, I want to stay stay above this. I want to stay around this number. I've already bought almost half a dozen little bits of bits of stocks from when I sold my first bit of AstraZeneca. Not not used up all the all the money, obviously, just tied little little positions. So I'm I'm doing a little bit of that. Yeah, you are. In the sense of yeah. increasing the number of stocks. Yeah. Uh, which I wouldn't have done before because I'm 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 not I'm still in the 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 mood or the frame of mind that we are in a bear market and th this 7600 on the FTSE isn't going to be sustained i want to be proven wrong pete by the market right and for us to you know people in january are going woo, 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 we're going to hit 8000 every single thing is against the market in 8000 this year now it's even got worse it's not just the ukraine stuff well, it's recession the only thing i would caveat that that against is that it really depends on what happens with oil and commodity prices, because we could see a bizarre situation where oil and commodity prices go high. We could perhaps even see the pound go lower and the FTSE 100 might do all right, but everything else get crushed. I, I, that's not unimaginable. And in a way, that's what's happened this year, because the FTSE 100 has held up better than pretty much anything. It has, and it's been helped by those commodities prices, mm. Pete. You know, it's been carried by, like we said earlier, BP and Shell. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to be faced with going forward, and we touched on this a, a good while ago when we spoke about the Ukraine situation, and that was about com um, the the raw material prices, especially the likes of wheat and corn. And now we've got inflation prices. Now, this is something that people need to need to be be aware of. We've seen a couple of profit warnings, and one of them was what Bonnie spoke about in the last podcast with B and B and M European it's been hit and it's been hit again today. It's down again BME, today. Yeah. BM, BME. So that's yeah. been down and that's, that's the middle market to lower market of retail investors who, who are buying consumers, consumer stocks. Right. This is from the ONSP, right? Mm. Pasta, right. From April, 2021 to April, 22 pasta prices up 50%. Cereal plus 10 percent, chicken plus 8 percent, rice plus 17 percent, beef up 16 percent. Now, everybody, unless the different dietary needs are required, buys those products. Mate, right? you missed the important one. Go on, tell me. Potatoes went down. So actually, potatoes went down. Are potatoes, potatoes lower? Potatoes? Actually lower? I don't know. Yeah, it was on the news yesterday. They were saying that about. Oh, okay. It, it, yeah, it was a bizarre. It was a bit of a well, weird outlier. Well, there you go. And I think right. So that's an outlier. Other. But you get the. But you get my drift. All of those Absolutely. prices are going up. So people are having to spend more per week on their weekly shop to fill yeah. the basket, to put the, in the cupboards, to feed themselves and feed their families. So. If fuel prices go up any further, there's less and less to spend. Oh. If people stop moving houses, there's less G less of our GDP being being grown. So I just I'm just maybe I'm too bearish, Pete. You know, I don't I'm think you thinking are. if I don't you're think looking you at it and, and saying, Pete, what catalyst do you see for the markets to be eight thousand? Well, the, the the ones I am seeing are oil stocks continuing to rise, commodity stocks continuing to rise. And I, one that I think people have, haven't really picked up on is the pound going lower. You think about it, right? One possibility over the next few weeks is a change of prime minister. It's, it's a bit of an outlier. That's and... being good for the markets, Pete. I no, really no. Don't... no, no. If, if, if there's more uncertainty because we don't know who the prime minister is going to be, I think we could see the pound go lower. And I think that effectively for overseas investors makes UK stocks cheaper. And I think it would also make it interesting from a takeover situation amongst the FTSE 250 and some of the small caps. Might do, but I think overall, if if we woke up next week and somebody said, oh, Boris has gone, I think the markets would go whoosh. Ah, ah, that comes later. You've got to remember, it's the period of uncertainty before we get a replacement for him. So think about the process, right? We're going to go through... I'm talking the about the immediacy, Pete. I'm talking about the immediacy of it. If you wake up tomorrow morning and they said Boris is gone, 
the market would tank. They wouldn't be talking about the, no. the FX currency rates. No, no, it, it, it wouldn't happen like that. The way, the way it would happen is you'll have weeks and weeks of dilly-dallying about whether the 54 letters are in or not. Then we'll get to the 54 letters, which could take weeks and weeks and weeks. Then we'll get into a leadership contest if he's defeated. Then that takes probably three months before we get a new PM chosen. So there's all that uncertainty in the market. Yeah, hey, but what happens the day after it's announced that he's gone? Well, no, it won't, it won't happen like that. What will happen is it will be a gradual move. Right. I asked the market. question for the third time. What happens the day that they say that he's gone? Well, they say it doesn't happen like that. The way it happens is that they'll announce I know that, Pete, but I'm, ask, I'm asking you one question. The day that they said Boris is out of here, what happens to the market? Oh, the market will rally, yeah. The market will rally. It would rally. So you're saying the day that First they said that Boris is gone, the market will rally. Is yeah, that what you're saying? That's a long time After away. all the dilly-dallying, the day that Boris goes, the markets go up, goes up. That's what you're saying? I, I think once they've, yeah, once they've chosen a leader, it'll go up. Okay. But that's, that's probably four months away at the earliest. And okay. you've got to remember tomorrow, he, to, tomorrow on out and out of character because he never gives up anything, he never admits to anything, right? Boris walks out. The pound what would tank. Then? I reckon the pound right. would tank. And what would happen to the market? Well, the stocks might like that. Remember what happened in Brexit? Remember what happened with Brexit? The pound tank, stocks rallied. We didn't. Puts 100 did. Put to 100, the market, really Pete, well. day after Brexit, the market tanked. We had that V, whoosh. Oh, mate, maybe the immediate day after it did, but within the next coming weeks, the foot to 100 actually You're rewriting really history, well. friend. I think you're rewriting some history there. Let's move, uh, let's, let's move on. Let's get away from the politics side of it. Yeah, yeah. Let's um, talk some stocks, Pete. Come on. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, there was, there was something else. Um, yeah, it's sort of related to the, to the Eric discussion, yeah? And uh, because we've had this discussion before that just as a general principle, if you want to improve your returns by having a more focused portfolio is often a way to achieve that, but obviously you increase more risk. So there's more variability of your returns. But one of the things that, that, was, that I thought was really important, we must sort of not lose sight of, is that one of the things we must all capture as investors every year is the gain that the market gives you anyway. So for instance, you know, on average, on average, the S&P 500 rises 8% a year, CAGR or whatever it is, yeah, compound annual growth rate. Now, it's very easy, very easy. So let's put it another way. You can beat 8% in a year quite often. You know, you can have years where you're doing 15%, you can have whatever. But you can also have years where you're losing 20%. But the S&P would have given you 8%. So you'd have been better off just buying the S&P. So I think it's really important not to lose sight that as much as, as much as a lot of us invest because we enjoy doing it and it's a bit of a hobby, but it also pays money and, and, and we love the fascination of it. You've also got that problem that if you're not, beating the market or at least matching the market then you know that you're not achieving what's being given you basically yeah I, I hear what you're saying i think the difficulty is is that consistently applying ourselves to the market doesn't always mean we get consistent results mm. and i think the difficulty with the market is that it's always attempting to make a fool out of every single one of us or as many of us as possible. And invariably, what worked in 2021, 2020, 2019 will not work in 2022. And we've seen that with regards to the tech stocks. Most of them have been absolutely hammered. Yeah. SMT, which everybody was hailing as the, the go-to fund to have 
has been absolutely spanked. Now everyone's considering now, mm, crikey, should I carry on? Should I average down? Should I buy some more? Should I lump in now? Is the, is the bottom in so I can get SMT cheaper because that gravy train is going to carry on for the next three or four or five years? It might well continue. I don't know. But just because it worked previously doesn't mean that they're going to get that run again regarding their portfolio. And they're one of the best tech pickers or have been in the past five years or so, It may, mm. maybe even longer than that. So I think that issue for investors is that they have to keep, I keep saying it and people are bored of me saying it, Pete, mm. we have to keep learning. We have to keep reading. We have to keep reflecting. We have to learn from our mistakes. And we've got to look at our portfolio almost on the basis of what is wrong in my portfolio? Not looking at what's great with my portfolio. What yeah. can I improve with regards to my portfolio? What's the weak links in my portfolio here? Which stocks have I picked? Which actually, the reasons why I picked them still doesn't doesn't hold true anymore. And therefore, they should be omitted. They should be kicked out. I should find better quality stocks. That stock I've held in my portfolio for three years, that's sitting there now, down 70%, 80%, that needs to rally. How much does it need to rally now to get back to break even? Get rid move on it's not going to happen it's not going to go up 500 fold right it's not 500 percent, pete to get back to break even or wherever it needs to get to get rid use that cash for something else you know admit that we're wrong you've got to admit you're wrong sometimes you know also, i put my tweets out and go been hit again 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent. i'm out i'm done and then immediate almost immediate that i've done that share price goes hello and it goes up or hello is a takeover. So what? That's part always of the away. journey. Yeah, always. You know. Away. I mean, it's... and if I hadn't sold it, it would still be lying there. It's... But come on, folks, we're, we're we're not all going to win. And Pete and I and others will say, "I've been hit. I've taken a loss." Some people won't, but that's that, that's that's their karma. Mm. You know. I mean, one of the things when you're looking at portfolio is, is look at the weightings as well. Think you know. Okay, I've got that stock. I'm happy holding it. But am I now really overweight in that stock? And that's, uh, or, or, or could you say, I really like that stock, but my goodness, I'm underweighting it. I need more of it. So there's always yes. that consideration as, as, as well as the should it be in, should it be out? There's the how much of my portfolio should be in it. Because that makes a position, real difference. Position sizing is, is, is vital. And oh. I've, I've been guilty of the overweight situation uh, regarding AstraZeneca. We've spoken about that significantly. Uh, in the past, I'm still overweight that position. I feel better now I've taken a chunk off the table, Pete. Mm. But it's it's one of them where I think the danger is you've got a stock and you, you've you got this this part of the, the investing side of it where it says buy and hold, buy and hold, and buy and hold works. It works to an extent, but it has to be the right company. And there's very few companies that you can hold for five years consistently and it just goes up with the market like that or 10 or 15 years. There's very few companies like that. There's always going to be something coming to knock that company off its perch. Mm. And we're seeing it now. You know, we've got inflation. We've got potentially recession. We've got talk of, you know, lockdowns or reopenings in China and so on and so forth going on and all the rest of it. We've got a war going on in Europe. You know, you're talking about whether, you know, the, the UK oh. president is going to be, you know, prime minister, sorry, is going to be still in his job by the end of the year. There's all these headwinds and all this noise, Pete, and the market's going, don't worry about that. We're sitting at, we're FTSE sitting at 7,600. We're all right. We're an island. We're all right. <laughs> we're immune to all this stuff. Uh, I'm going, are we really? It, it's, it, it's an incredible time because, I mean, you know, we've both been investing for a good long time. I think you're around nearly 30 years, aren't you? I mean, I'm sort of nearly 25 or whatever. You know, so Bill Young. Between us, we've seen quite a bit. And I honestly can't think of a time when there were so many macro issues. I, I really don't remember it. Maybe in the 70s, but I wasn't investing then. I was sort of running around in, in short trousers, if that's scary. Yeah, I was running around, yeah, believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even in the country, Pete, in the in, until the mid-70s, so, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, you didn't, you didn't miss so, much, yeah. mate. You didn't miss, uh, you didn't miss <laughs> anything, but... But um, hey, um, another stock that I wanted to mention, and it's quite good because it introduces an investing concept that's quite useful. Um, 
Duke, Duke royalty, yeah? Now, I hold Duke royalty, and I'm very You would know that, Pete. You've never mentioned it before. Have I never mentioned Duke? Have I never, ever no. mentioned Duke? Um, I oh, hold my Duke, gosh. Duke royalty, and, and, and I'm very happy to continue doing so, and it pays a big dividend. Now, the point is, right, Duke recently did a play scene, okay? Now, obviously, when you hear the word placing and you know it's an aim stock, you immediately get worried, you know? But I think my point is here, we need to make a distinction, right? So let's think about the nasty sort of placing, the kind of placing you don't want, right? So when you've got a company that's barely making any revenue, right? not making any profit. It may have some forecast profits in the distant future. Um, and then that does a placing where it issues a load more shares. So say it issues another 25% of shares. It means that any earnings that the company eventually generates get distributed amongst 25% more shareholders. So your earnings per share you're going to get in the future has been diluted. You know, it's been reduced. So, so obviously that's, that's, you know, not great news. Um, now, you've got to make a distinction between that and the kind of placing that's happened with Duke. So with someone like Duke, right, the way the business model works is that Duke have done that placing. Now, there were some issues around the placing. I don't totally want to get involved in that. But the point is that they do the placing and they get a load of cash, right? They will then use that cash to invest in some royalty partners and those, they'll start getting a royalty, royalty um, stream. Every month they get a royalty feed from the royalty partner. Um, so, it's, so in effect, the money that's been placed starts generating earnings straight away. And that's very different to that previous one we talked about when the company's not even making any earnings. And this is relevant because it also applies to a lot of the green, you know, the green sort of um, battery, battery storage companies and the wind farm companies and all the rest of it. They quite often do a placing. But what actually happens is that money is taken and it's invested in assets that then generate a return that is much higher than effectively the cost of capital. I think that's really what we're talking about here. Now, the beauty for existing shareholders is that in the case of something like Duke, it diversifies the royalty base further. So it lowers the risk in that sense. But it also means there's future opportunities to make more royalty investments to that new royalty partner they get. So, so it's so. Uh, did that make sense, Pete, or not? It probably would be. Sad, yes, it, it makes sense. Look, I would have. I, the thing for me, Pete, is that a lot of these battery storage, solar, wind, blah 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 companies that are out there at the moment, they identify a project or an asset that they want, right? And whether it, it's a case of they need another twenty million or another two hundred million or whatever it is, from there to there, they then do a fundraise. Yeah. for that amount or there or thereabouts. And they most often than not enable all the current shareholders to participate in that. And then they then go and purchase that particular asset that generates more of revenues for them and yield for them to enable them to pay those shareholders again, but also pay off what they borrowed. So that's what they carry on doing. And that that's what works regarding that particular thing. So if, if that's what Duke could do, is that what Duke are doing? Yeah, that's they're right. Buying they've, additional got assets? Long, they've got a long pipeline of, of opportunities they're working on and they basically needed more capital. And the thing is, because of the way their model works, because they're giving out like, you know, six, seven percent dividends or whatever it is, they're not retaining those earnings to be able to reinvest in royalty partners. Maybe they should. Maybe, you know, maybe there's an argument to perhaps the business model should be different. Who knows? But okay. as a do you carry any debt at all then, Pete? Do they carry any debt at all? I think they've got a bit. I think they've got a bit from memory. I, I, I don't see yeah, but as, but as long as they're able to cover their, their dividend payments um, oh, substantially, yeah. 
then that's 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 a reasonable sort of sort of um situation but it's a slow and steady sort of of, of growth i think the the conversation we've had about the tech stocks pete is that you know after we had the the, the situation of 2020 a lot of the tech stocks did so well and we're seeing we've spoken about it before we're having this rotation as such now that people are going back into buying you know the tobacco stocks that were shunned before yeah, you know exactly. buying some of these even insurance companies are being purchased and you know obviously we're worried about inflation so the retailers are getting sold off as such but oil gas some of the infrastructure stocks have, have done reasonably okay mm. you know I, I don't see the tech stocks having a 21 like they had before or a 2018 that they had um this particular year unless something significant happens but who knows we're going to be i'm sure we're going to have another you know we're heading into to june we're going to have another x amount of months towards this year of volatility and, and very interesting things but what we have been saying throughout year to date and possibly the last the last year is that we're going to see more takeovers you mentioned fx and sterling going lower and therefore stocks being a more uh, approachable um better value for the overseas predators and that's what's happening we've seen a lot of overseas predators coming and there's more stocks as i keep saying each podcast you're going to have a stock at some point or other any of your listen, listeners to this podcast will have another takeover in june i will guarantee there's going to be at least five or six foot c slash aim takeovers um going forward and people are going to go whoop, whoop, you know up 20 percent, 30 percent from where they were previously Oh, yeah. um, and once again, all I will say to you is, you know, have a look at your portfolio. And if you see someone jumping in front of the bus going, oh, I bought them recently um, without ever mentioning it before that they held a stock, just ignore them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just ignore them. No use, no use to man or base. Um, I had a quick look on SharePad there. Um, it was just a, a, a quick look. I mean, obviously, you need to dig deeper into the figures. But it says that Duke's got 16.5 million of debt. So that, that rings true, just a small amount of debt. Interestingly, it's got on there. Now, this, I think this must allow for the extra additional shares that have been issued, because we're talking a few weeks now. So analysts will have adjusted their forecasts. It's saying 6.7% dividend this year. And then 8.1% dividend next year. So I'm very happy to hold on those numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if people, people I'm ask you a question because, sorry, go on. If people are interested in using SharePad, there's a sort of, um, we have we have a lovely lady comes on and, and, and does a voiceover thing. And um, and basically you there's, there's like a code, like you have to put Twin Peaks into the SharePad promotion box discount thing and, and you get a month's free data you'll hear it in the gap anyway okay okay i was going to i'm going to ask you about your thoughts there's always this this time when the markets are wobbling and we're talking about inflation that people have well, already this year been talking a lot about buying gold or commodity related stocks i purchased the recent one a gold related stock oh. i've not disclosed it yet wow but i wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about not lithium we've we've talked about lithium loads but but gold as a stock investment not buying the gold but gold related stocks what are your thoughts on the price of it where the stocks could go i don't know i find i find gold a really weird thing it, it um i'm just looking on sharepad now because i have it set up on sharepad as one of the things i look at reasonably often um it always seems to me that I think there's a lot of folklore around gold. You know, people say it's a great inflation hedge. Then they say it's great when there's no inflation. <laughs> and, you know, and I just find it one of these things that that never seems to make a lot of great deal of sense. And, uh, you know, for all the predictions of how it's going to move, it I don't know if it ever moves in the way that people sort of claim it does. Um I just find it really sort of irritating in a way. Um, looking, no, but the, I think the point I'm trying to make, Pete, is that across the AIM and across mm -hmm. FTSE, there's a lot of gold mining stocks, right? Some of them actually make a profit, Pete. Oh right? yeah, and and they're not all trash, and you don't have to go into the FTSE and 100 to actually. Moment. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, after going the FTSE 100 to buy them, there are some other smaller ones. And I've been looking and looking and looking to just broaden my my portfolio and also get, you know, some some that capture a dividend. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to have a little nibble up at that. And that's what I've done. I think going forward, I think we're going to be seeing more and more people seek, seeking what they claim to be safe havens. I'm not saying this one I've got is a safe haven, but I'm trying to find other stocks that, A, if the markets recover, could do well. And B, whilst I'm waiting, it may or may not be able to pay me a dividend. Mm-hmm. You know, and if I can capture 10% whilst I'm waiting, yeah, as a CAGA or a total return over oh, the course yeah. of a year, that's better than the cash sitting there and me going, oh my gosh, I can't find anything to, to can't find anything to wear, <laughs> can't anything to, anything to pick. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. And I've got too much cash sitting on my, my, my portfolio after the AstraZeneca cuts. Mate, before you excite us all and tell us which stock it is, I've just I'm not telling you what it is. I'm just I've just looked at the gold chart, yeah, and it seems to me that for the last oh, actually, it's quite a while. So it's certainly a year, may even yep. be a little bit longer. I can't. Oh no, it's about a year. I think it's really been going in the sideways range, and the top seems to be about. Two thousand and fifty dollars. Yeah, that seems to be the top yeah. of the range, and the bottom of the range seems to be down around seventeen hundred dollars or a little bit below yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it just seems, and it really has been jiggling around within that range, yeah. and it's heading down mm. towards the bottom of that range. Well, it's, as we speak, it's on. It's at eighteen forty-four, so it's towards the bottom end of that range. Mm-hmm. Which is arguably a good time to be buying a gold stock. So yeah, if it's going to yeah, be I mean this and this is what I'm saying. So, sometimes you have to buy when the market says it doesn't make any sense to be doing something like that. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks investing podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code Twin Peaks. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peets promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. The, the, the other thing I want to talk about um, stock-wise is GSK and, you know, We've spoken we've spoke about it quite a lot um, of late because there's lots going on um, regarding GSK. Yeah. And essentially today they've decided to to spend or up to 3.3 billion p buying a another business which is called um, I couldn't I couldn't pronounce it this morning. The vaccine thing, isn't it? A Finny a, a Finny fini Vax. Yeah. I, yeah. Pr- I probably pronounce it wrong. Uh, mate, if you're I out there, John, you sure you correct me when um, when when you get on Twitter. Um, so they spent it on a biopharma vaccine company, 3.3 billion. And obviously in the next two months, three months or so, we're got, it's going to have the spin-off with Alien as well, the consumer side of it. Yeah. So it's a very interesting time for um, for um, DSK. Um, our good friend who was on the show um, just recently uh, was kicking himself. Um, Henry was kicking himself because he's... Um, hello there, Henry. Henry H.T. Viola. Um, really good guy. But unfortunately, he was kicking himself because he bought it near the low and then sold out because he got a, a bit impatient. But I pointed out to him that um, Keith Ashworth Lord, the Buffettology Fund, had also sold out of GSK betwixt the range of 15 to about 13 and a half pounds um, to buy other purchases. And um, from what I can read, the purchases that he did buy um, didn't do so well um, for the Buffettology Fund. And he would have been better off just keeping GSK. So anyone that did sell out of, of GSK, don't feel hard done by because plenty of experts have also sold out of that stock. Um, and it's going to be a bit, very interesting time um, regarding GSK and the consumer yeah. unit. 
I've just seen there's a bit of news for people that are interested in Unilever. You've seen um, Pelts coming out and taking a big chunk of, of a stake today in Unilever. That's another undervalued, I think, stock. It's got everything going against it regarding inflation and cost and logistics and you name it. Um, but if Pelts is going in, taking a 5% or whatever percentage that he's taken in, that tells you there's value to be had in Unilever at some point. But what he tends to do is, you know, I don't say he asset strips it, but he, he, he makes sure that they, they run as a more efficient machine so that um, more profits can be made. So I would keep an eye on Unilever and watch that stock. And if an opportunity comes up and it dips again below when Pelts bought in, might be an opportunity for other people so that want to buy in the long term. Pelts, like, I've no idea what his first name is. Do you know what his first name is, mate? I can't remember the top of my head. Nelson, at the minute, Pete. something like yeah, Nelson. Now I got it. Nelson Peltz. Um, Nelson Peltz, Trian. Yeah, he's yeah. like a U. What is a U? A, a U.S. activist investor or something. Activist, yeah. billionaire activist. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bit, bit, bit of a bit of a geezer. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay, wow. Pete. We, we've done an hour, so let's get one more yeah. stock in at least, mate. If you've got it. Yeah, mate. Um, well, I got a funny feeling. So on a recent podcast, I talked about another one of my stocks, which was VTY Vistry. I wasn't going to talk about it today, but I just, it's just this morning, there was a load of CEO buys. So just, you know, Greg, Greg Fitzgerald bought some. So just, I'm just putting that out there. Um, right. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll raise this one because I've never heard of it before. You ever heard of Glan Glantus? G-L-A-N. Nope. nope, not on my radar. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a fairly new IPO. I would have said it IPO'd about six months ago. It's you know done the usual thing, had gone totally down the drain. Um, but it does. Um, they had results a couple of days ago. It might even have been yesterday. And um, they do um. You know, like the accounts payable function of a company. So that's like when a company sends out invoices and gets the invoices paid. And they have like a whole accounts function that deals with that. Yeah. They do software to sort of speed that up, make it more efficient, make it more automated, blah, blah, blah. And um, I mean, I don't know if she, I've got a feeling I looked on SharePad yesterday and it, it had the numbers, I think um for like forward pe's and stuff let me just quickly whiz that up yeah so it's got full forecast pe of 20.4 falling to 13.5 and it's got a market cap of 20 million now that's slightly concerning because 20 million is a pretty small company obviously it was a lot bigger than it ipo because it's fallen mm. a lot but you know, maybe there's something there. Maybe it's something for, for people to have a look at and, and to think about. You know, I don't hold it and I probably won't hold it. And who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows what will happen in the future? But I just, it's one that I'm now aware of. It's now on my radar. The results read pretty well. So maybe there's something more to it than, you know, so many IPOs are just garbage, aren't they? But this one, maybe this one's got something in it. So, you know, something to look at anyway. Thank you, I'm going to change things up a little bit. I want to share this. I shared, I shared something regarding um, farming quote a while back. And I just want to share this with other people um, that I wrote um, yesterday. I'm going to read it as I wrote it so people can actually take a bit of time to stop, think and reflect about how they're doing, what they're doing, how they are, how worthy they are, worthy they are. and just to take care and take stock. Because I think a lot of people um, are having a difficult time of it out there at the moment. OK, I'm just going to read this as it is. Um, the title is Live Your Best Life. Know what you don't want, as there are far better things ahead. Never underestimate your true worth. Enjoy your life as this is not a dress rehearsal. If no one's told you today, then hear this. You are doing great. Life is precious. Cherish it. And the picture I've added to this is never hate your haters. Respect them because they're the ones who think you are better than them. Chill out, folks. Thoughts, Pete? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the ones that hit me is life is not a dress rehearsal. I mean, that, and, and to be honest, that is a tough one for me because I feel I've had pretty tough year or so, nearly getting on for two years where I've been in pretty miserable pain for quite a long time. And it has definitely held me back from doing things. And it's, you know, and it really, it really brings it home that when you've got your health, when you are able to do things, you've got to crack on and do them. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of fairly confident that I will get back to being able to do the things I want to do, but it certainly brings it home to you. The other one that, that rings a bell is, or, or that, that chimes with me is that thing of, I can't remember, it was near the start, and basically the message I pick up from it is don't do things you don't want to be doing. And I think think we've all been guilty in our lives of doing things often through a sense of duty or a sense of obligation or whatever it is. We get sucked into things, we end up doing things we don't actually want to be doing. Just don't do it. Just cut it out. Just only do the things in life that you like doing. I like doing these podcasts. So, hey, we'll keep doing it, you know? And, and that's the way I think, I think it's a good way to think about your life. Your life is too short and too valuable. And, you know, to be doing things you don't enjoy, it's just daft. So just stop yourself doing it. Get out mm. of it. It's, it's bad news. Yeah. I, I, for those of you that haven't listened yet, there's a other podcast I do. It's called the Investing Matters Podcast. And there's some, some significant individuals there, including John Newman, Algie Hall, John Stepek. And the recent one I've done with Mark Dampier has, has been off the charts regarding people there. And um, the last one that's out, and the current one that's out at the moment, is with a chap called Tim Rogers, the former CEO of AB Dynamics. And I asked him a really pointed question, and he, and he just flattened me straight away. And as, because he's a former CEO, he's had, he's had a very busy life oh, it's big, yeah. and, um, you know, done fantastically well. I said, oh, is there any chance of you coming back in, you know, six months, 18 months time as a CEO of a FTSE or an AIM listed company? Because he's so sought after. No, <laughs> straight away. <laughs> Absolutely not. And people don't realize what a difficult job it is to be a CEO and to run a business and to deal with all the different facets of that job. You know, and I think we sometimes take it for granted that, oh, I'm going to fire an email off, da, 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 this, this share's not going great, the CEO's rubbish, the CFO's rubbish. It's a big old job running a company, whether it be a £5 billion company or a £5 million company. It's a big old job. Um, and I think that's that thing where it's only when you step out and you look in, you're thinking, crikey, I'm worn out here doing all of this. Um, and it's it's hard. And I think we just need to take time. And I'm, I'm planning the best I can, Pete, um i've got four or five weeks before the mini boss finishes school for the year and we'll admit we'll be in july and i'm just going to take stock mate and you may you only see me on a wednesday <laughs> you know what I mean? i'm going to be gone because i'm just going to chill out i'm going to try and enjoy myself as much as i possibly can because life is too short and it's not it's 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 not a dress rehearsal and that saying and i keep repeating it is from phil oakley he said that to me ages yeah. ago and i'd never forget when he when he said that to me i just stopped and thought what does he mean mm-hmm. and and it's like i get it now too busy running around like that and actually not actually doing the things that i want to do and enjoying life you know what i mean i do all the stuff i do in the community i do all the stuff with the charities but sometimes you've got to do a bit of self-care pete oh yeah and wheelie it, dealer has to look after wheelie dealer you know what i mean totally and, and it's and it's that thing that you know if you enjoy doing a lot of the, the community work and stuff you, you're doing and whatever, then great. Yeah, brilliant. But if you get to a point where you're thinking, this is now annoying me, just stop doing it. Do something else, you know? And, and even if it's another thing in the community, do something different in the community. Often it's just shaking things up and doing something different if, if you're finding you're not enjoying something. I'm a big Absolutely. believer in that. If, you, if you're not enjoying it, stop it. Um, absolutely absolutely do you want another stock if it's going to be short and sweet pete one more stock from peter wheelie go for it it's just one that i'm sort of aware of again a fairly recent ipo it might certainly in the last year um and it's one i read about today in investors chronicle and i thought what a great business this probably is but what puts me off is valuation 
And that's a company called Auction Technology Group, ATG. You haven't, you haven't bought it, have you? It is on my radar to buy. I have not bought oh, it, Pete. You're all it's right, another then. recent IPO. It went off the charts. Yeah. I have got it in, I've got it a buy zone there yeah. and there. I'm yeah. not telling you what the buy zone is. That's but cool. it's on That's my cool. radar, Pete. Well, and the reason why, before you say anything more, the reason why I've got it on my radar, Pete, is because of, right, we've got all of these things that are saying recession, did it, did it, did it. And then we've got all of these people saying, okay, we need to get rid of that factory. We need to get rid of that. We need to downsize. We need to get rid of that property. Did it? Yeah. All over the world, people are going to go, right, look, let me buy that. Don't need. I don't need to go to Sotheby's. I don't need to fly to London. I don't need to go to New York. I can just go online and I can bid. Yeah. So that's what I like. It's a slim, slick machine. It's. I think currently right now it's still overpriced, but that's just me being greedy. Well, that's, that's where I am on it. What appeals to me, I hadn't thought about it in the way you've described it, but what appeals to me is the platform business. It's that simple fact they've got a software as a service platform that anyone who wants. So if you've got like a car dealer who's always done physical auctions in a presence and wants to go on the internet and do it online, they just go to ATG and ATG sorts them out with a SAS, S -A -A -S, cloud solution, away they go. So I, I think it's cracking for that. Um, but as you say, it's a case of what valuation would be appropriate. And it's, it's showing on SharePad at the moment on a forecast PE of 38.1. And then two, two years out, that drops to 29.3. I wouldn't have said that is prohibitively hideous, but I would certainly say if it was down near a sort of 24, 25, two years out, I'd be more interested, you know? Yeah, this is the thing. In a bull market, if it's a tech stock, they would happy, they'll happily pay 40 or 50 for it. Yeah, you know, and there's been time in the past when other U.S. stocks are uh, you're going, what's oh, the PE on that? You know, it's just yeah. crazy. And right now, when things are getting reined in, you can't give it away at, at um, 35, 35, 45, whatever, you yeah. know, and you can't even give give some of the tech stocks away now at 15 of a PE. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting one. Pete. I think at some point that will also uh, base because the people that bought at the IPO and sold the share price go up um, and now have seen it come down. We'll be wanting to buy back in, but I think when the market bases and then starts to go back into a bull market, whenever that may be, mm. I, I think that share price will be significantly higher. And it's, especially if they match that with growing revenues. Yeah, I think it's interesting. The other thing I did notice is it appears to have quite a bit of cash, possibly, possibly twenty. It's just IPO. It's just raised the money. They haven't spent any of that money reasonably yet. I think what they'll do, is, I think with some of the cash they've got, and this is, this is my limited research I've done on it thus far, is that they're going to use some of that cash to be acquisitive, to boost what they're doing, their platforms, mm -hmm. and buy other little niches that are out there to, to expand on their, on their reach uh, globally. Yeah, because there must be other companies doing a similar thing. There's all, there always is. Of so a smaller nature. Buy competitors and bring them in. So, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, it's an yeah, interesting yeah. one. And I love that, you know, it's that platform business where you're, you effectively have sort of low to fix costs that can then get spread over more and more customers. So that's, you know, every time the, the, the marginal cost of adding a new customer is tiny. So that's absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I see the well, sense of that. So we're on the same page. Yeah. Neither of us own it. How stupid is that? N no, yeah. <laughs> not yet. We will see. I'm, I think, Pete, because I'm, I'm just still cautious of the markets. I've yeah, dipped my toe into there. Boohoo, we spoke about before. I've dipped my toe over there with yeah. that one. There's one stock which I've just gone. I'm having loads of that. Lumped it. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't, I'm, not, I'm just going to watch and wait and see what happens. You know, and if it goes lower, happy days, I'm going to lump some more into it again. You know, I'm just trying to look at the markets and duck and dive because I'm uncertain. And if I'm uncertain, yeah. I'm not going to go where I'm going to go, actually, I'm going to be 100% invested in the market. I can't do that right now. I haven't done I, that for quite a few years, in fact. I'm, I'm really not doing anything at the moment. I just, I just feel I'm happy to sit aside. There's one stock I'm particularly interested in. I nearly moved on it the other day, but I held back. I might move on it in the next couple of weeks. I don't know. I do quite like it, but 
I'm quite happy sitting with my cash at the moment. You know, this is a long year. There's still plenty of months to go. There's going to be plenty of dramas ahead. And I just think, what's the point of rushing? I, I've got loads of money in the market. I don't need to put any more in. That's the point. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, folks, that is a wrap. That'll be Twin Peaks Investing Podcast number 76. If you enjoyed this, please, please, please make a donation to Pete's Just Giving page, uh, Backup Trust. If you enjoyed it, please give us your feedback, share it on Twitter and retweet it and tell everybody what your thoughts are regarding it. And is there anything that you found regarding this podcast that you didn't like, share that with us as well, because we're trying to learn and trying to improve it. Hey, if you didn't like it, tell us. Is there a like button on YouTube or something that people have to like or something? Yeah, like? there's a like button on YouTube. You can yeah, like it on YouTube. Like things, brilliant, I, thanks. We, we didn't mention YouTube. The numbers regarding Vonnie's podcast on YouTube have been absolutely brilliant. Lots oh, of people yeah. are moving from, from SoundCloud and other places and actually wanting to, to see on see us on on youtube sorry i say us they wanted to see bonnie, bonnie on youtube <laughs> they want to see how we're ugly mugs so you know so try, check us out on youtube you can put as pete says you can always push youtube through on your telly and watch it on the big screen as well you don't have to watch it on your laptop or your phone so you can see us in in high definition all right folks that's a wrap i want to tell you all to take care god bless stay safe and be kind take care bye, bye for now see you pete Cheers. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Mm -hmm.